Please be seated. <laughs> Good afternoon to a special meeting, a valedictory lecture of Professor Bert Helmsing, who has been here with us in ISS for 40 years. Uh, and a very warm welcome to the International Institute of Social Studies of Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Um, friends, colleagues, students, PhD researchers, family. Um, we are very much looking forward to hear the valedictory from you, Bert. But before we do so, you first get a laudatio. And that's done by our colleague, Professor Peter Knoringa. And I give the floor to you. Please listen carefully, Bert. <laughs> okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think Bert always listens carefully, uh, Inge. So that um, the theme for this laudatio is that you, Bert, embody the true spirit of ISS with your passion for capacity development combined with demanding the highest analytical and conceptual standards. And that you have followed your own path, sometimes going against the fashion of the day, but always with a clear strategy in mind. In short, in the earlier parts of your career, you have done a lot of policy and societally relevant research and teaching, as well as management. In the last 10 to 15 years, you have reinvented yourself as an academic during the period in your career where most professors are actually starting to lean back and recycle their earlier ideas. <laughs> I really admire you for this counter-cyclical approach, reading, thinking and writing more and more in your later years instead of drowning in management responsibilities. Obviously, in such a long career, you've gone through various phases as an academic, as a researcher, and as a teacher. I'm not going to dwell on details, and I'm not going to dwell on the more personal part of these trajectories, as I know that you prefer occasions like today to focus on more serious academic exchange. Your path and that of ISS have been strongly intertwined for the last, and I'm going to say 43 years, because before you actually started to work here, in 1973-74, you did a diploma course in regional development planning, which you apparently liked so much that you followed that up by a master's program, also at ISS. Now, the master's program was then a rather new thing. Most people did a diploma. And the specialization you followed in regional development planning actually had two students. You and Joao Guimaraes from Portugal another legend uh, at ISS. Through periods in Colombia and Zimbabwe, and a PhD defended in Tilburg University, and I'm happy to see that Jos Hilhorst, one of your promoters from the ISS side, is here today, um, you became a much sought after consultant and evaluator by, for example, the World Bank, Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Donor Committee on Small Enterprise Development, Danida, SNV, and many other Dutch NGOs. You focused in that period on two areas of work in two policy domains. On the one hand, local government and decentralization, and on the other hand, small and medium scale enterprise development, later extended to local economic development. You became recognized in the 1990s, and you still are, as an expert in these two fields, and especially in, bring, in being able to bring together the academic and the policy making discourses in these areas of work. In other words, Already in the 1990s, you did what we now call societally, societally relevant academic work. And I never really asked you, but you have probably shaken your head as you are smiling now a few times about the present trend in Dutch universities, that academics should also think about their societal relevance. You have done that already for decades. And I remember when I joined ISS in 1997, you were a real role model for me in how you were able to combine academic work with the participation in policy interventions. But you did not stop at that. Instead, you've moved on and reoriented and deepened your focus in the last 10 to 15 years. PhD supervision became a new passion, a new and more specialized way to contribute to the capacity development part of our mission. 
As a supervisor, mentor, or teacher, you have co-shaped new generations of academics and practitioners with a much sharper eye for complexity and with an understanding of the need to systematically interrogate one's explicit and implicit assumptions about realities. Bert would never be tempted to see only one factor as decisive, nor would he be captivated by one overarching ideology. Instead, he has always been acutely aware of the importance of power and the debilitating impacts of harsh inequalities without advocating revolution. He's a great coach and mentor, avoiding too much hand-holding and really demanding in terms of analytical clarity of arguments. Perhaps grumpy at times, but always caring and constructive. Next to doing a lot of PhD supervisions, while you more or less stop doing the intensive consultancy expert missions abroad, you developed a new area of expertise in institutional theory. And with determined enthusiasm, you developed this third line of academic work around institutional theories as a way to underpin and reassess your earlier work on the two more policy and practice oriented fields of local governance and local economic development. You've provided major contributions to the literature, not only by connecting vertical value chain thinking with horizontal territorial thinking, but also enriching both these literatures through blending in insights from institutional theory. In this way, you have in recent years brought fresh ideas into the literature. You were also among the first to identify the complementarity between research on hard and soft power. So the research on regulation and the research on trust, while most people tended to look at these issues separately. And long before this became fashionable, you have been an advocate of research teams containing different disciplines, and you actively moderated multi-actor processes. In all of this, and perhaps most importantly, you have always been guided by empirical evidence, not by sweeping ideologies. Finally, and this will not come as a surprise to most people here, Bert is always strategic. I'm not going to say or imply anything about Bert's behavior in his family context, but here at ISS, whomever you ask, the answer always contains the word strategic. Not because of a hidden agenda or something like that, no. He's straight, honest, and clear about what he feels would be good for ISS or for a specific group in ISS. And then he operates strategically to get there. This is perhaps best illustrated through two small recent examples of your engagement in ISS management. A few years ago, you played a key role in establishing one of our four ISS research programs, the one on civic innovation, which was initially opposed internally but by mobilizing the external referees, you were able to turn the table and change the internal dynamics. Second, you've always been willing to take on the ungrateful and unglamorous, but very necessary tasks in an organization like ours. Most recently, you showed your commitment to the Institute as one of the so-called trusted persons in helping us to recover from our latest and quite painful reorganization. Also here, your straight and strategic perseverance has helped ISS a lot as a final piece of evidence to show that you embody the true spirit of ISS. Now it's time for you to deliver your valedictory. After that, Georgina and I have a surprise for you, but first it's high time to give you the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. World trade and production are increasingly structured around what we know as global value chains. A value chain can be defined as the full range of activities uh, to bring a product from its inception to its end use. It includes 
uh, stages such as design, production, marketing, logics, logistics, distribution, support of final consumer and recycling. Michael Porter has argued that a firm can generate value in all stages, but it can also focus on those changes, on those stages in which it excels and leave other stages to other firms. Thus, activity can be divided between different firms. And if these are spread over more countries, the value chain is regarded as global. The increasing importance of global value chains means that the international division, division of labor becomes organized around tasks or business functions located in particular countries instead of countries being specialized in entire product chains. What applies to countries applies even more so to local economies within countries. The processes of economic restructuring on a global scale have made local, local economic development much more volatile. Given the increased global competition and pressure on prices, one way to avoid the race to the bottom would be to extend and improve the participation of local producers in their value chain. Global value chain theory holds that the governance of the chain shapes the opportunities for such upgrading by local producers. This has been a powerful uh, argument for the rapid popularization of the value chain concept in development interventions. The positive message of upgrading also became a guide for local economic development. There are nowadays a number of manuals to guide development practitioners on how to apply value chain analysis. These are prepared by NGOs, by donor agencies, by knowledge institutes, and the Donor Committee on Enterprise Development, which has an important function of interagency knowledge exchange, has an elaborate website on the topic. These manuals, with some notable exceptions, have in common that they mostly limit themselves to the chain itself and the coordination between different actors in the chain. However, the manner in which the value chain connects to the local economy is not only shaped by the relationships within the chain, but also by the context in which the chain has touched down and become embedded in the local territory. In early years, value chain analysis focused on the lead firm and the governance of the chain, as argued by Gary Greffy, and asked what governance conditions would be most conducive to local firm upgrading. This received an additional impulse with the so-called supermarket revolution, uh, explained by Timothy Reardon, which focused attention specifically on the role of global food retailers in organizing global chains. In the last years, last 10 years, the attention has shifted to the role of standards and their implications for upgrading, as exemplified by the work of Khalid Natvi. For me personally, this shift brought the study of value chains closer to a parallel field for, in which I had become interested over the past years, which Peter just mentioned, namely institutional analysis. Value chains can be seen as a set of institutional arrangements or rules. These arrangements define the terms of participation of each actor in the chain and by implication what value gets appropriated where in the chain. This makes value chain analysis a field par excellence for institutional analysis. But what then explains institutional arrangements and how do they facilitate or inhibit upgrading? The opportunity to study this came several years ago when I, together with Dr. Sietse Vellema from Wageningen University, directed a research project funded by the Development Policy Research Network. The most important academic output of that, pro of that project was published in this book. In a synthesis report, at the end of that report, we formulated a knowledge agenda. In this document, we made an attempt to elaborate how global value chains interact with local institutions in order to produce certain context-specific developmental outcomes. And we identified four processes that describe a pathway, pathway to such outcomes. That meta framework is shown here. As you can see, two processes relate to the to the articulation of chain dynamics with contextual dynamics in the territory, and two processes are situated within the boundaries of the chain. The two processes on the left-hand leg are rarely developed in value chain intervention manuals I referred to earlier. 
In terms of a logical sequence, process one depicts the touching down, which concerns the interaction between a new value chain and the business system in which it operates or intends to operate. Process two is restricted to the dynamics within the chain that defines the terms of selection of areas and inclusion of local producers. And process three is about, is about leveraging interventions and resources of the chain in order to endogenize its development locally. And the fourth process concerns the prospect of upgrading of local producers. One of the consequences of the argument developed in this framework is that a, f a strong focus on only standards and the compliance with them captures, uh, captured under the process of upgrading is only one piece of the puzzle. And from a development perspective, it may not even be the most significant one, despite the developmental objectives included in many of these standards. Before elaborating the, on this framework, I would like to end this introduction and briefly outline where I stand in terms of institutional analysis. In development studies, the recognition of the role of institutions is a relative recent phenomenon. It started in the late 1980s and especially in the 90s with the work of Douglas North. Since then, there has been a veritable proliferation of concept and ontological perspectives in various disciplines and a lot of energy has been spent on stressing disciplinary differences and opposing, re opposing views. See, for example, the review articles of Hodgson, Kingston and Caballero, and Menard and Shirley. I will highlight the following points with more details in the uploaded version that you can find on the ISS website after the session. Institutions are not only rule practices and norms that are constraining human behavior, but also enable or guide that. Certainly in development studies, there is a wider acceptance of the historical institutionalist and political economic views that political institutions shape the process of change of economic institutions. Look at the work of Chang, Holland Taylor, Kahn, or Asimoglu and Robinson. The overall social structure and its associated distribution of power, as well as vested interest in the existing institutions, shape the direction of institutional change. And the politics of institutional change therefore becomes more important. This, however, is further complicated by the relational view of institutions, whereby institutions are not only independent, uh, are not independent of time and place-specific meanings. They are embedded in local, social, and cognitive institutions. There is also a greater recognition of what Leftich and Sen noted, namely, institutions rule, but they do not reign. They need to be maintained and enforced. And for the study of institutional change, it is therefore essential to examine the role of individuals and organizations in such processes, as done by the work of Scott. To end this introduction, it is important to stress that I do not have the intention to give an overall verdict on value chain development interventions, on their effectiveness on promoting smallholder participation, or on their overall developmental impact. My main aim is to make a plea for a better understanding of the institutional dimensions of value chain interventions. But in the extended version that you can download, I give a short overview on what, has, what is currently the state of affairs on the developmental impact, and I present some figures. The interaction be between firms and the local institutional environment can be examined with, with theories concerning comparative capitalism, which focus on institutions of economic coordination. The central premise is that, a that firms need competencies to maintain competitive advantages and challenges. These competencies can be obtained in a variety of ways. They can be created inside the firm, or the firm can acquire them externally. Alternatively, the firms can coordinate outside the market and develop competencies through joint or collective action. And last but not least, and in the face of industry-wide challenges, firms may engage the state to provide these through industrial policy. The institutions that permit strategic coordination between firms and between firms and the state 
form the institutional basis of comparative advantage. The key point is that such institutions are formed in a past-dependent historical process, and this may vary considerably between countries as well as between regions in countries. This complex of institutions and state and business organizations we call a business system. The business system sets the basic parameters within which a new value chain can operate and determines the room for maneuver with which chain-specific actors act vis-à-vis -vis non chain actors. In relation to the institutional foundations of comparative advantage, I would like to highlight two strands of literature. Here I elaborate briefly on their founding fathers. First, I start with the work of Hall and Soskise on varieties of capitalism, and the second one refers to the contributions of Richard Whitley on business system theory. According to Hall and Soskise, the above-mentioned coordination problems that firms encounter may notably be found in the areas of industrial relations, wage bargaining, working conditions, vocational training and education, how to secure an adequate skill base, corporate governance and investor relations, inter-firm relations with suppliers, buyers, communities and other so social actors, and in the area of employee relations. And the authors elaborated the two well-known institutional configurations, namely the liberal market economy and the coordinated market economy. Institutional complementarities reinforce past dependence of a particular system. The reason being that complementarities between institutions yield increasing returns. And this results in institutional isomorphisms leading to coherent national or regional specific systems. Whitley's work on business system framework was originally designed to explain the major differences in economic organization between Japan, South Korea, Taiwan and Hong Kong and how these differences can be traced back to pre-industrial institutions and their specific pattern of industrialization. As regards the institutional structuring of business system, Whitley identified similar elements as the one I just identified for Hall and Soskise but in addition, he elaborated on the role of the state. How do business systems look like in developing countries? Research has characterized business systems of countries in Asia, for example, the work of Carney and that of Whitley, of course. For Eastern Europe, there is the work of Nolke and Fliegenhardt. And for our purposes, I will elaborate on the segmented business system in Eastern Africa and the hierarchical market econo economies of Latin America. Wood and Freiners identified the segmented business system of Tanzania, Uganda and Kenya as the institutional basis of economic failure. The authors maintain that institutions for economic coordination may not generate efficient solutions even though they may be highly functional to generate revenues for specific actors and maintain existing power relations. According to the authors, I quote, Defining features of African business system is the central role played by informal networks interpenetrating the indigenous elite and concentrations of activity in the metropole, both in the hands of a relatively small commercial and industrial class and TNCs. End of quote. In a segmented business system, there are strong divisions between the export oriented and non export oriented sector, and within the latter, between the formal and informal economic activity. TNCs, transnational corporations that is, and the local managerial elite can relatively easily develop indigenous business relationships and networks. They also can potentially invest in upgrading, but they only do so if that fits the strategies of, uh, if those local strategies fit in the global uh, plans of their parent companies. Moreover, governments in these systems rarely engage in proactive industrial policies, a point I will explain later. The indigenous firms in this system are small and owner-controlled and operate on the edge of the formal sector or in the informal sector where competition is fierce. Economic coordination takes place basically through arm's length market relationships. Firms lack access to formal financial markets and are threatened by competing imports. 
Moreover, political uncertainty limits their expansion. Informal activity is often survival-oriented with weak or no access to state support and often relying on informal networks of credit and mutual assistance. There is associational life that serves community and political purposes rather than economic collective action. Given the enormous power imbalances, public officials can wield disproportionate power over this subordinate sec segment and are able to steer local development processes. In a segmented system, business system, there is limited complementarity between formal institutions. In fact, formal institutional sort files are compensated by informal practices. The authors clarify, I quote, the segmented business system is particularly characterized by a low degree of institutional complementarity in specific areas other than the areas directly serving the immediate, immediate interest of a small elite. End of quote. Using the, uh, the variety of capitalism uh, perspective, Schneider has attempted to describe the core features of the Latin American capitalisms, referring in particular to countries such as Colombia, Peru and Mexico which he denominated as hierarchical market economies. Its core features are the existence of powerful business groups, the presence of TNCs, and the dominance of a lowly skilled labor, uh, labor force and atomistic labor relations. These family-based grupos economicos are conglomerates of diversified and often unrelated economic activities. Until recently, they uh, operated mostly in domestic market. Each business group maintained strong centralized control over a large number of subsidiary firms. These grupos economicos may represent 20% or more of a country's GDP. TNCs and their local subsidiaries are also hierarchical as far as technology transfer, capital investment and local supplier-buyer relationships are concerned. concerned. In some respects, the hierarchical market economies resemble the coordinated market economies insofar as non-market forms of corporate governance is concerned, while in other respects they resemble liberal market economies, for example, in terms of labor relations. But it is a variety in its own right with its own enduring institutional complementarities. Even though these countries may have developed important business associations, which may enjoy the support of relevant business groups, these business groups may act in their own private interest, overriding collective interest when it comes to political influence, as is shown, for example, by the work of Redberg for Colombia. The high volatility of state and social inequalities increase economic uncertainties, and this stimulates business groups to remain diversified, flexible, and maintain arm's length relationships. If we accept that economic institutions are shaped by political institutions, then we need to bring politics into the picture. According to Kahn, a key goal of a ruling elite in developing countries is to remain in power, and this may involve buying the support of particular groups in order to sustain its power and buy political stability. All the groups and individuals that support a ruling elite together form the ruling coalition, which may be broad-based or dependent on a few powerful groups. And a political settlement then refers to the set of institutions and power relations characterizing a social order in a particular country. A key consideration here is that low-income countries, that in low-income countries, the formal sector and domestic public revenue base may be too small to buy such political stability. Moreover, formal institutions confer rights to any individual or group, irrespective whether forming part of the dominant coalition. Members, however, of the dominant coalition may prefer to operate through informal institutions of their network, rather than become exposed to the competition of other entrepreneurs. In similar vein, new formal institutions introduced through policies may have distributional effects that do not benefit the dominant groups, and hence they may either oppose the reign of these new rules 
or demand informal compensation. This means that the formal sector cannot be seen as an island of efficiency in a sea of informality, as was always maintained by the modernization viewpoint. Because the formal sector itself is deeply embedded in a mix of formal and informal institutions that characterize a particular settlement of a country. Kahn shows the mechanisms at work. If an entrepreneur would not belong to a dominant group, formal institutional support would be less effective, since the dominant group would demand a share in the benefit through informal institutional arrangements. But if the would-be entrepreneur does belong to the powerful group, he or she would not need formal institutional support, as such support would then also become available to rival ent entrepreneurs not belonging to the group. Instead, the entrepreneur would prefer personalized informal arrangements that would enhance his or her business venture rather than formal industrial policy. Only and only if industrialists as a group would be able to discipline themselves and demand formal industrial policy and open competition would such formal policy work as intended. This is an implicit as assumption in many of the donor policy propositions. Kier uses political settlement theory to explain why in Uganda certain policies uh, to strengthen the institutions in the sector were successful and were sustained while others were initially successful but later waned. Awartwi and myself concluded that the derailment of the country's initially widely acclaimed decentralization policy cannot be explained with changed economic arguments of the policy itself, but, it, but by changed political conditions. The business systems of, for example, Colombia and Uganda are fundamentally different. Since the departure of the Asian business community, Uganda faces a missing middle of medium and large-scale domestic enterprises which, would potentially, which potentially can lead domestic segments of global value chains. As we saw above, the ruling coalition may have a far greater interest in primary exports and in aid, and recently in oil, than in promoting the competitive, competitiveness of domestic enterprises not to mention a long-term interest, interest in promoting the upgrading of small farmer, small fa smallholder farmers and informal enterprises unless they were to constitute a core constituency in their power base. Instead, the coalition is likely to prefer a bargain with an external actor, maybe China, or a TNC. In Colombia, we find the business system dominated by large business groups that control substantial sections of the formal economy. In my PhD thesis, many years ago, I traced the origin of 21 of such groups and have shown how these are linked to the regional economic histories of the country. The Colombian state is characterized by formal democratic structures, but as we saw above, the influence of domestic economic groups is strong and the control of the state over the regional territories is comparatively low. On a number of occasions, the state, the Colombian state, has ceded taxation powers to such gr business groups via their business associations. This already occurred in history when the National Coffee Growers Federation obtained the exclusive right to export coffee and impose a levy on exports. More recently, the state has ceded uh, to raise uh, so-called parafiscal funds to business associations to finance their collective action under the competitiveness agreements. This is a rather peculiar form of public-private partnership to improve competitiveness of Colombian value chains in the face of greater participation in the world economy. For much of the details, see the work of uh, Alex Blandon, who did his PhD here at ISS and defended it in 2012. Many value chain studies focus on chains in existence, but the analysis should begin with the question if there is to be a chain and where the chain locates. Baron et al. argue that the agro-processing firm selects geographical areas not only on the basis of production considerations, 
but also takes into account chain logistics in terms of warehousing, transport from farms to collection point and processing points. Thus the firm, the lead firm, will prefer to choose the most accessible regions and are most likely those with the best developed physical and economic infrastructure. It is furthermore likely that firms who prefer to enter areas where farmers already have exposure to market relationships and where chain promoters such as NGOs are active and provide training and technical and financial support. In that regard, we know from many studies that also NGOs tend to select high potential areas that to promote economic development and do so in areas that are not too distant from the national or provincial capital. Barrett et al. are not beside the point when they conclude, I quote, an important implication of the geographical placement effect is that they tend to reinforce geographic poverty traps and regional inequalities, end of quote. How do local producers consider their participation in change, their inclusion? This has been an important issue in our latest book. One of the often implicit assumptions concerning developmental impacts of global value change on smallholder producers is that their inclusion is considered to be a good thing. But that cannot be assumed a priori. Small farmers face market failure in accessing credit, extension and other inputs, and chain participation and its associated interlinked institutional arrangements can help address these. Overcoming market failure in these complementary markets can even be an important incentive for small farmers to participate in chains, even if the return on investment for themselves is low in comparison to other actors in the chain, as very recently shown by Gloria Otiena, uh, Otieno in a recently defended PhD here at ISS. In the first two st uh, stages, we have seen that the value, ch value chains are selective in their choice of territories and locations. But can value chain development be leveraged for local development? Can it help to break an existing lock-in or a low-level equilibrium trap? And can it create a new sustainable local economic development path? Our earlier work confirmed that many value chain-based interventions, either by NGOs or firms, show a primary interest in leveraging towards their value chain. They do not feel responsible for a better local embedding or for the spillover effect in other chains in the territory. These are primarily seen the responsibility of government. But there is also the empirical observation that rarely lead firms can effectively coordinate all activities in the chain. And this may be a motivation for, for lead firms to be concerned about local conditions in order to improve what we call the systemic efficiency of their value chain. This may, for example, underlie corporate social responsibility or strategic philanthropy investing in the local economy via local actors such as NGOs or government agencies. This is a point elaborated by Porter and Kramer. Strategic coordination can be used for both leveraging local development for, local, for value chain development as well as for leveraging value chains for local development. And this brings me to the following questions. Can value chain specific measures to address market failure become generic solutions to these failures? Can value chain development in an area trigger the, formula the formation of clusters and enhance collective efficiency? Does the value chain create capacity and competences in local actors that can be deployed to diversify the local economy? And do local actors have the capacity to engage really the lead firms? In the extended version, I elaborate on all these questions. In all, leveraging is focused on the question, can externally driven development from these chains be endogenized? If not, then one creates an often temporary enclave. Global value chain theory is conceptually not equipped to answer this, as it looks only at the organizational linkages between firms in the network. But the endogenization concerns spatial and temporal linkages between the global chain and the local economy. The process of upgrading is closely related to the functionalities within a value chain, 
and it has received a lot of attention in practice, in policy, and in research. Upgrading can be defined here as increasing the participation of a particular actor, actor in the value generated in the chain. This may consist of process upgrading, product upgrading, or functional upgrading, or even switching to a more rewarding chain. In the extended version, I give an overview of what are the kind of value, value chain interventions that are practiced in development uh, interventions. For now, I will briefly look at four institutional arrangements that form part of these developmental practices, namely standards, producer collective action, platforms for strategic coordination, and public-private partnerships. In mainstream policy and practice, standards are seen as the pivotal institutional arrangement for upgrading of local producers. The debate on standards has become a complex one. I will not enter into the debate on particular standards and their relative merits. My colleague Peter Noringa <laughs> is the expert on this. So I will only know two things. Many company-driven standards are a combination of market considerations based on price and quality and industrial considerations concerning standardization and efficiency. NGOs, on the other hand, stress in their standards, domestic or place, and civic considerations. And their standards may not only, are not only intended to benefit individual producers, but also territorial communities. And as very recently Reynolds has shown for fair trade, mainstreaming that label has the danger of watering down the territorial com civic dimensions in the face of industry-wide demands for uniformity and efficiency. Secondly, adapting global, value ch global standards to local conditions in a well-intended effort to improve small producer access to these standards is often a process that takes place over the heads of the local producers themselves. Talentire very recently showed this to be the case for the Kenyan horticulture, where a Kenyan gap standard was created as an alternative for global gap. Narod argues uh, that a rural producer collective action is important in three phases in the pre-production phase for obtaining information and knowledge about contracts and market, as well as about these food standards and how to uphold these. In the production stage, it is needed to establish food traceability and group monitoring systems and get access to extension services and inputs. And in the post-harvest harvest phase, it is needed for collective marketing, grading, sorting, certification, as well as maintaining a group monitoring system and to engage other stakeholders. In examining smallholder upgrading in Central America, Helen and others showed that the group formation process is challenging. It is costly, needed skills are lacking, mistrust or too strong social bonds may prevent enforcement of rules, and the politics may creep in. These points echo in our own work. In Uganda, the lack of clarity on agreements between the processor of honey and the lead farmer and between the farmer groups and the individual beekeepers, as well as a post-war context of lack of trust and skills, make it made it very difficult to handle the moral hazard and adverse selection problems in the chain. In Peru, after a long period of trial and error, institutional arrangements were spelled out in detail and selection criteria and sanctions were imposed now by the farmer groups themselves. Platforms, the third one, serve strategic coordination and have the potential, uh, the potential to connect smallholders to other actors. The participatory market chain approach stresses the importance of two types of stakeholder platforms the local platforms between producers, local government and service providers, and chain level plat uh, platforms where farmers associations interact with other chain actors, such as traders, processors, supermarkets, and so on. And the type of complementarities and synergies that, that these platforms generate differ. And in the extended version, I give some examples. 
Public-private partnerships are an independent but complementary institutional arrangement, notably in providing or facilitating extension and information services, infrastructure in the area such as roads, dry or wet ports, storage facilities, etc., facilitating capacity building and training, for establishing and operating coordination mechanisms such as platforms discussed here. Poulton and McCartney see but a scope for private sector investment and maintenance in rural roads and irrigation and markets and rural ICT. And on the part of government, small farmer access to extension service or fertilizer can be improved through contracting out or via demand stim stimulation using voucher schemes. And smallholder credit market failure could be reduced through loan guarantees to banks or distributors and stockists. Coming to the end of my lecture, we see that value chain practitioners often look at the chain institutional arrangements in isolation. But if we look beyond, beyond the lamppost at the local institutional con local context, several issues come up. Firstly, there may be competition between different standards, each with its own monitoring protocols and associated cost, but also competition from other types of institutional arrangements arm's length transactions or intermediaries, intermediaries that propose informal contracts. Secondly, institutional arrangements associated with upgrading may have knock-on effects on existing local institutions. Dolan, Catherine Dolan showed how development interventions can conflict with the complexities of local social organization and how these are appropriated, transformed and resisted in unintended ways. Value chain development interventions to benefit smallholders are often based on a gender-blind picture of a unified household, but the introduction of contract farming in horticulture in Kenya converted agrarian households in sites of gendered struggles over land, labor and income. Thirdly, smallholder systems are complex and not limited to one single chain. Mohan uses the livelihood framework to examine the effect of global value chains on local institutions because upgrading in a chain needs to be seen in the context of small farm or other livelihood strategies. Chain institutions, such as standards and payment modalities and grading rules, have implications for local institutions in the area of labor, in finance, in informal norms in the villages. Smallholders may respond to chain institutional arrangements if they can manage to absorb the consequences of chain participation on these local institutions, or if they succeed in incrementally adapting these through processes of bricolage. Upgrading could well occur, but also with immiserizing growth. In the words of Moham, and I quote, immiserizing upgrading can be defined as a strategy of a value chain actor which targets improvements in the chain governed, li governed livelihood factor, such as improved, improved market power or higher price, yet have adverse implications on other livelihood factors, such as gender, productivity or risk, such that the net result of the strategy is worsened welfare." End of quote. To conclude, I hope I've made it clear that we must be careful when valuing a value chain intervention. This was the trick in the title. And avoid acting like an elephant in a porcelain cabinet, if I translate literally a Dutch saying. Or like a loose cannon, that in all haste of a quick and timely delivery of measurable development results causes more damage than good to local development. Finally. I have spent my whole working life in the formal employment of the ISS. Although at various moments in my career I was offered opportunities to move to another institution. I have stayed with ISS. The main reasons being its size, its diversity, its quality of its staff and students. These 40 years have been the heydays of development cooperation. And the ISS was very much part of that system through, indeed, capacity building, contributing to development. That period has come to an end, and the institutional context of ISS itself is rapidly changing, 
and so is the ISS, its organization, and even its students. I thank the board of ISS and Erasmus University for the confidence they've placed in me during these years. I know that normally in such occasions, such public occasions, you don't mention names. But this is my last event, so I seize the moment. I begin with my teachers and my later colleagues, Jos Hilhorst, where's Jos? There's Jos, and the late Francisco Uribe, who were not only great teachers, but who also shared their vision and experience in networking way before that word was invented. I thank the many colleagues with whom I undertook capacity building projects and advisory and research assignments abroad, especially Guillermo Lathrop in South and Central America, Raymond Apthorpe, Des Gasper, and the late Fasad Mourir for an unforgettable Zimbabwe experience. They, as well as Hans Opschoy and Fritz Wilf, were excellent team, play team players and in a world of many prima donnas, that is a real compliment. I also would like to thank counterparts in capacity building projects abroad. Fernando Cepeda, Edgar Reves, Rafael Pardo, Edgar uh, Eduardo Wills, and most recently Javier Pineda at Uniandes in Colombia. Nathan Mutizwa Mangiza, Kunrad Brandt, and Katme Wekwete at the University of Zimbabwe, where we did good things, where unfortunately Mugabe has undone a lot of it. Carlos Sojo at Floxo, Flaxo Costa Rica and the staff at RLDS at Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia, especially Fenta Mandefro. I could not undertake so much capacity building activities because I could do that because at ISS I could rely on the fantastic administrative support of Els Mulder I don't know whether she's around. She's coming this evening. That would be very nice. And her colleagues. Ah, there is Els. Yes. And her colleagues in the then planning office. Other administrative staff who over the years have helped me a lot were Henri Schreibril, the former director of ISS, the administrative director, and Siska Forselman. I would like to thank my colleagues from Dutch universities. With whom, we, uh, with whom the Ceres Research School was set up, with Ari de Ruiter as its chair and Tom Dietz in the, cent in the management team, and the colleagues of Working Programme 3 of Ceres, with whom we developed, uh, we developed encounters and organized them for our PhD students and developed research. I think especially of Isabout, here present, Gus van Westen, who is I think also around, over there, yes, thank you, and later Annelies Soma and Sietse Vellema. My counterparts at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Maarten van Bunningen at the then known DPOEO, these acronyms are known to the officials, uh, Theo Kolstee of the Speerpunt Urban Poverty and SMEs, Robert Jan Scheer of DDA, Fred van der Kraai and Nico van Niekerk at IOB. Thank you all very much. I thank my colleagues at ISS, notably in Siri, where Wendy Hartcourt, Case Beekhart, and all the fellow researchers in that group. And in the past, staff group three, Freek Schiphorst, Irene van Staveren, uh, Saskia Wieringa, and Tandam Truo. And of course, closest to my heart, the former LRD group, especially Peter Noringa, Georgina Gomez, Erhard Berner, and our ex-colleague Nicolas Awortwee. Over the past 40 years, I estimate I must have engaged between 1,500 and 2,000 students in diploma, masters and short courses at ISS and abroad. So much diversity and quality, both academically and in commitment and in life experiences. Most dear to me are the many PhD students whom I supervised. They may not realize that I may have, had more, I may have learned more from them than they from me. Last but certainly not least, I have shared all this work with my partner in life, Annette.
we and our children, Nico, Laura and Paul, have had great times together abroad, but I was also a partner and father who was often away on mission. And that you managed the triple burden with a smile on your face, also it for me difficult times. Thank you so much. We will now celebrate our third age with a lot of new ideas and plans. Thank you all for being here. Ik heb gezegd. Thank you so much, uh, Bert, for an inspiring lecture and personal words. Um, it's not finished yet. Uh, I invite Georgina Gomez and Peter Knorringa to be here and just relax, Bert, and listen again. <laughs> this will only take a few minutes anyway. We would now like to disclose the surprise that Peter spoke announced earlier on. Dear Bert, let me present you this book with essays in your honor. You can come. <laughs> <laughs> You can open it. It's in plastic, you can <laughs> tear it apart. Local governance, economic development and institutions has recently been published by Palgrave Macmillan as part of the Global Development Series of the European Association of Development Institutions or Institutes uh, and is now on sale for the global market. Peter Noringa and I started working on this book back in 2013 when Ariane Corradi, later graduated and back in Brazil now for a couple of years, she started gathering the intelligence on the PhDs you have promoted in your career, colleagues you have published with, and people that you have worked around the world in your many capacity development projects. It has not been easily easy for me personally to navigate my desire to keep this as much a surprise as possible and at the same time to get from you the information I needed <laughs> to complete it and the collaboration I needed also from others to achieve the best possible result. So the book follows the three areas of research on which you have concentrated in your career and contains 16 chapters with 22 authors. Editing a volume with authors scattered in several continents may appear an exhausting task, but it has been unusually fluent, probably motivated by their desire to present today in written words or in spirit. I would like to mention the persons now who participated in this book. And starting from the top right, we have Ariane Corradi from Brazil, Nicolas Awortui from Ghana, Takawira Mumvuma from Zimbabwe, Alex Blandon Lopez from Colombia, Holly Ritchie from the UK, Jerome Aban Awortui from Ghana, and then myself. This, we collected the photos of our PhD graduations. You would have been the person at the other side of these photos giving us the red tubes which later became blue. Um, other authors, are precisely your direct working teammates at the local development area, including Peter Noringha, Nicholas Awarty, Erhard Berner, and myself. I'm sure you recognize the event of the photo. And then we have, of course, a list of authors which you, with whom you have already published in the past, friends, colleagues, 
from universities in the Netherlands and in Latin America. Starting again from the top right, we have Rocio Rosales Ortega, who is sitting at the back, from the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana in Mexico, Eduardo Wilson Reira, Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia, Jan Franson and Meine Peter van Dijk, also Erasmus University in Rotterdam, in a way, Annelie Somers and Hus van Westen from Utrecht University, Isa Baud, of course, from the University of Amsterdam, Joy Clancy from the University of Twente, and Sitze Belema from Wageningen University. So, dear Bert, it is a great honor for us to be able to present you this book today. As you can see, you retire, but your work carries on. And now it's really finished, at least this meeting. Uh, we have a uh, reception in the atrium on the first floor, and I invite you all to come there, have a drink, have a snack, uh, congratulate Bert, talk to each other. And for information, the uh, lecture will be on the internet on online uh, tomorrow. So if you're really interested, want to read it again, can be done. Uh, Bert, thank you so much for everything you have done for ISS, especially also indeed the trusted persons. We know each other for a shorter time. Uh, thanks a lot for everything you did. Can I invite you to take the lead with your family? And then we follow. Thank you. 